Krauser, go get the girl. I think we had like a pay line in the 80s, um, but uh, I could try and find you the number. No, 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 no. The door has, there's a shape of a, um, a phoenix crest on it, and I've only got a, a Mexican candy. Uh, seriously though, how did you get this number? Did they put our phone numbers in the magazine again? <laughs> That was weird. Anyways, back to back to Johnny 6.5. Yeah, this should do it. All right, go, kill! MDK! That's right. Destroy them, my robot! Figured we'd stop on by. Um, yeah, we're gonna after this. It's gonna be a good day. We're gonna take him down to down to the pier. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Well, uh, well, let me see if I can I can find someone that can show you. You know, you know, we can do something else too. I, they got their bag lunches with them, so if I can leave them here, oh, and really? Just play, play some games for a while. Um, they really like. They're real big fans of uh, uh, 
of all, yeah, some of the guys on the show, so you know, I figure I'll just leave them over there. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that if that's really gonna work for us. But uh, let me let me see if, let me see if I can have someone show you around real quick, huh? Yeah, come on, come on over, come on over, and at least give us an autograph, and I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, uh, I I work in auto body. Oh really? Uh, you know, you got a dent in your car, you whatever it is you need, you know, maybe we can uh, do a little little. Uh, you know the old bartering system. Oh, okay. I'll, well, uh, let me see if I can find someone for you. I'll be, I'll be right there. Sounds good. Sounds really good. Thanks. Oh God. Yeah. Oh. Wait. So everybody's doing comics. Yeah. All of those. What's that? Those pink. Trackmania United. Oh, I'm Mania. supposed. To, oh, I'm supposed to clean. I'm supposed to. Clean. Make that jump up to the top. Yeah. So this this is the thing that they made that um, swarming car demo. There was there was a video kicking around a few months ago. Remember yeah. where there was like a thousand cars and it looked like yeah one K project or something like that. Start out as. I don't know much about this except I've seen some videos and some some attention to it now that it's all collected together. But the deal with the Steam thing is it's like all the best stuff from all well, over Europe like, or something. That's like the deal with United. The whole thing is that the game's been around for a while and this is like a best of collection. Yes. So like it's all been... user generated tracks. Uh, is it all user generated? Not, not all of it. I think the single player stuff isn't user created. The multiplayer is really where it's at with this game. It's all hot lap based, I guess. So. So you're seeing, so you have like, Damien was explaining, you have like five minutes or hour long on each track to set your best time. And then at the end of that time period, it shows like the leaderboard of how you all did, all, how everyone scored on that track. It's definitely not that much about the driving, it's more about the tracks and, you know, when you hit like five loop-de-loops in a row, like a core screw, and then hit, hit a huge jump, and then it'll end up crossing the finish line on your roof. Like, you can tell it was intended to be played like with the arrow keys, right? right. Like digital you input, tap, well tap, 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 tap. So you can you can actually put together as much of this stuff as you want to. The editor is really versatile. You just start dropping stuff in the environment, piecing it all together however you want to. That's why you yeah. see all these crazy, you know, loop the loops and then sky bridges how, and how does that edit to work? Is it like yeah, you've got a whole bunch of different track options to choose from and buildings to place and terrain objects and and so you just pick what you want and you kind of all match it up together. You can adjust, you know, what height everything is at. So you build a track and then you share it and then so it's very um, little big planet kind of thing. Yeah. This is a really, really user-driven game. Completely user-driven game between all the content. And they have this front end that's called the Mania Links where, so if you know XML, you can write a page that will be displayed within the game and, you know, share. That's where all the car, car models and the levels are all shared is within the game. No, but wait, you gotta know XML to be able to do it? No, you don't. You oh, don't okay. at all. You don't have to know anything about XML. If you, you you get to enjoy the fruits of these guys' labors of doing that, and if they want to, they can make like this little storefront that's inside the game, yeah. and if that's their cup of tea, they can go do that. You don't have to know jack shit about oh, it. Oh, well, that's good. But if you want to display it within the game inside Mania Link, then you, you can write pages in XML, and then they could be right here inside the game. And so, you know, if someone wants to check out a 3D model or whatever, they can go check out Jambon's you 3D You sound so enthusiastic for something that is so bullshitty work. I mean, like, I don't want to work. <laughs> Jam Bottom's doing all the work. Right? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're not actually doing any work. I haven't seen the same track twice in the online stuff. It's just who knows what you're going to hit next. And I guess the people who are good at it have actually practiced up on the servers they're going to be on because the tracks go all over the place and they put obstacles in me like Christmas trees and all kinds of crazy crap. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you're just trying to figure out which way the track goes and you know where to jump from one platform to the other. So, yeah, you kind of need to practice them, but that's part of it. I think the big deal about this and the reason it's been so popular in Europe is all the community angle of it. And it has all the stuff that like, Microsoft's trying to sell you on Live Gold and yet this game does everything that Live Gold does with connecting people together, having messaging within the games, having them playing together, all this sort and sharing, sharing tracks, sharing skins. It's everything that people have gotten accustomed to already. Weird twist, isn't it? Like building the city instead of having it spring up out of the ground. It's like not really some city anymore. Some is it? city reborn. What's this? What's this about? How did? How did it being reborn? 
project. Why am I the last to hear about all these things? What is this new Sim City business? Well, it's city building, very masculine it's sort of really thing. Girls. Yeah. Okay, so why are you guys doing this? <laughs> <laughs> The whole idea behind this is like creating a society. And there's how many different societies they say they're gonna like come up with? This right. thing? There's uh, six social energies in the game. Ooh. Social energies. Which they, they act as sort of currencies unto themselves. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, you the, the, the buildings that you put down and kind of the decisions that you make will will uh, influence how you how you you earn point in those social energies and your your society changes to reflect that. Right, so if you start putting down um, buildings that are devoted to obedience, say, like a gulag or whatever. It's 1984. You might have like a vanilla city where it's just a regular old standard uh, metropolis like the old Sim cities. But once you start planting down buildings that have, uh, that are specific to these certain kinds of characteristics, like obedience, you put down a gulag, now, you, now the game is saying, oh, so this guy's into discipline in his in his society so now we're going to populate the the city with residents that are going to reflect that so you'll start seeing riot police out on the street you'll start seeing uh, security cameras appearing on all the different buildings that have been created to watch over the citizens so that's how the city is evolving as you build it and whatever you do the game will reflect that so you can start doing it that way but then maybe you're thinking eh, this is a little too dark actually I don't really want to live in an Orwellian society I want to live in happy clownville so you build whatever a clown factory was one of the things it was right? one of the things but yeah. it was really weird it's like the whole thing had this crazy Tim Burton art style approach mm -hmm. to it right which was cool I actually really it's dug cool. that part yeah. because I think where they're thinking of it is to push you down one path or another with those social energies. So like create different, you know, extreme societies. Cause it seems like in the middle of the road, you're gonna have all kinds of weird, you know, train yeah. wrecks between the societies. Right? It's like it's like a spiritual building onto the idea, but not really saying it's it's a big social experiment game. Right. And to me it feels very much in line with the Sims franchise. And I don't yeah. think it's that far removed if you look at what they've been doing with the Sims for years, you know, where where the personality, uh, uh, where you're managing the personality of the city as much as you are the buildings, which is really how you did, how you played the Sims, right? You had to keep your Sims happy for your, for your family to grow and your and your Sim to grow, and now you kind of have to keep your city happy, or you have to what how you build your city is gonna is going to influence the personality that your city has. Like, like Sim City is a big sandbox that you play with, mm -hmm. especially like the last one because you didn't just create one city, you created like a bunch of cities and tied them all together and built like all that infrastructure between them. And this isn't really like that at all. Yeah, I think there's no question that like hardcore long-term fans might, you know, initially get kind of pissed off by this or skeptical or worried that they're like fucking up a, a pretty uh, important franchise here and, yeah, and loved franchise. I'm a huge fan of SimCity, and what you guys are describing sounds more like Sims City, which That's isn't really yeah. what I want. That's a good explanation. And I would, if they're going to call it SimCity, I kind of want that next step. But you know, to be honest, SimCity 4, I still play, and I still can't imagine how you could improve it. See, so, so that's what they brought up, and that's right. why I think they did this. This is like an offshoot project for them. Who was the who was we were interviewing? We we thought the Sim City Four was a brilliantly executed uh, point of the simulation track of urban planning, um, and it really nailed all those physical attributes. And we we were sort of fearful that any design we did might start veering back. Uh, towards our territory and we definitely wanted to do something different and so you know placing it with an experienced different developer uh, made a lot of sense and was a lot of fun as well really. Um, I'd met uh, uh, Tilted Mill, Chris and his group um, quite a few E3s in a row and it was a series of those meetings of hey we should do something, hey we should do something and eventually it was like ah wait a minute we know those guys and we went back and forth and they were really enthusiastic and it really fitted in with our um, our uh, allure to risk with this franchise. We're like, hey, you know, let's let's really put it here, and then we know we're going to get something different. You know, these guys have got so much experience; they can actually have a lot of back and forth. Um, so that that was the reasoning: is this developed relationship of talking back and forth, and then the right opportunity. 
And that's what this is about. It takes all the good part out of The Sims and kind of like lets you, I mean, like what do people do with The Sims? Like how many stories you hear about people taking, taking families and sticking them inside rooms and closing them off and doing like weird experiments on them. So this takes that idea from a, from a micro size and expands it out to, you know, way more than macro. I mean, it takes yeah. it out to like city scale. I think that's what they're really hoping for here is to capture that kind of goofy, weird Sims dynamic in the Sim City game. Like it's more of like a God game too because you're you're in control you're less you're less the city planner just like like sim city always got that feeling like i'm just tweaking stuff but everything's happening and i'm just yeah. kind of adjusting stuff here and there to make you're sure you're trying to get that balance you're trying to get that circle of life just so to right. maximize everything exactly right and they seem to be going less for circle of life here yeah than like your own weird you know you're your own weird dictator or you know benevolent clown in charge or whatever of Clownville. Could I build this society built around destroying clowns? The Orwellian we saw society. All the clowns get rounded yeah. up and hauled off to jail. This, this, See, so yeah, there you go. That was the fun, yeah, now that, that was cool too. Right, so you start with the Clownville, and then you make that be Orwellian. Yeah, so like, then they start rounding up all the clowns. They, they were throwing down, what was that, like the, the Ministry of Thought Police, and right, I mean, right. it's all this crazy, it's double all, think. Yeah, yeah, double think, exactly, uh -huh. they did all that kind of stuff, and then, then they send out the guys in the, in the black trench coats to go pick up the clowns, <laughs> and you're like, like, oh boy. I mean, I, I think they sort of had to go this way, you know, I, yeah. I think what you said is, would be the exact problem, the SimCity 5 might just have been kind of meh to people, like, well, why do we need another iteration of this thing that was kind of already there? You know, better for them, I think, to try something bold and to go in a different direction. And, you know, really, they kind of hedged with us, too. We wholeheartedly agree that this is, um, it's a very new direction and it's very risky. And I, I find that exciting. And just as a game maker, I like to do that kind of thing. It's like, wow, thank goodness, you know, you guys aren't doing the same thing every year after another. Um, if uh, our, our Sims city uh, player base don't like it for sure they can expect the next iteration will be back to basics i can <laughs> assure you um and you know we this could end up being a separate fork um you know we could end up doing a sim uh, a sim city society's line in addition to um, a regular um you know, a regular construction line I mean, th these these things are really about finding finding an audience you mentioned the community, and that's going to be another area where the community right. struggles. Is they've been very big in creating custom buildings and custom, you know, landscapes and stuff to add into SimCity. Mm -hmm. Is this system going to be customizable in that same way? Will the community still be able to get drawn in and you know have that tinker element to it? And they didn't tell us all of that stuff right no. now, but they did acknowledge that they, of course, are thinking about it. And given how good they've been with community in Sims One and Two. Right they probably have some cool stuff in the works. I mean, I think they, they deserve the benefit of the doubt at this point. You guys left it, I mean, feeling excited about this new Sims City? I think or, it was pretty cool. Yeah? No more of those damn water pipes. No water pipes was huge for me. Because that killed my spirit way back in Sim City <laughs> too. Not just for the Sim series, but life in general, having to, <laughs> having to do those water pipes. It was never dark recovered. time. Yeah. All those pipes flowing nowhere, not knowing where the missing link was. I don't know, I mean, this is gonna be weird for me because I like SimCity as a game that every so often I just turn on for a day or two and mm -hmm. tinker around with. And then, you know, I'm happy that they call me up. I'm good with my SimCity 4 fix and I go back on my merry way. This is not gonna be like that at all. This will be much more like the kind of games like the Impression Guys built for, which is you'll get into it and you, you'll get involved in it. Or maybe like a SimCity uh, or Civ, what was that, Civ Rome. Mm -hmm. That it's like sort of got like that same sort of vibe from this thing, except with you know modern setting, and then the really driven artistic and, and social engineering mm -hmm. angle. Probably the longevity of this game is going to be determined on whether they really can do the sandbox thing, right? Right. Because isn't that what keeps us coming back ultimately Absolutely. to the Sims games? That's probably why people still have SimCity 2 or even the original is because of the endless tinkering with your with your city. If it turns out that this is just kind of a little playground to create Zombieville or whatever, and, and, and that wears out, the novelty wears out, it won't last. Rated M for Mature. Hey boss, I got what you want.
Who's on the 8th floor lobby? Hello? Hello, is this Dan Shu Su? Yes, this is. Um, I'm, I'm in the lobby. Um, I've been emailing you and you haven't been responding to my emails so that I emailed you. <laughs> Who is this? Um, my name is Rob. And my probation officer says, says I, I should get back into the workforce and I, I want to be an intern. Can I at least use your bathroom? Okay. I've got IBS. I want to see who that is. <laughs> Yeah, so it happens all the time. Just people just stop by kind of randomly, you know? It's yeah. Weird. Like uh, how much they want the job. I mean, I appreciate the ambition. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about World in Conflict. Real-time strategy or RTS is the quickest way to, to describe it because you know people walk by and they see a bunch of little units and they see me lassoing them with the mouse and stuff so they hit the RTS, right? Yeah. But it's all tactics more than anything. I mean, there's no resources whatsoever. They're just counters that allot a certain amount of points to each team and each player on each team and they just take up on their own. But other than that, you can come and go during a match. So instead, you know, in a typical RTS, part of the hassle is sitting there in a lobby waiting. In this game, people come and go all the time and the game doesn't stop, it just keeps going, you know? So like if, um, say we're playing, you know, a 6v6 match, one of your teammates drops, then what happens is you guys get, get his extra, you know, resource numbers, you know, whatever it is, his points to spend as you want. So it bounces out because you're gonna have the ability to still bring in more tanks, helicopters, infantry, it kind of sounds like uh, Tom Clancy's End War, which is a console-only RTS, but they, they're trying for the same kind of thing. It's like, it's not about resource management or collecting resources. It's just, okay, you're allotted so many points and you could dedicate, if you want to get the more powerful yeah. units or get a bunch of smaller units, right. remember that? that? That sounds like really similar to it. Um, but it's funny that, you know, this one started on PC and then the whole emphasis there is that it's console centric and that you don't need to be doing a million hotkeys at once, you know, because there's only so many units and it actually works that way on 360. And I'm, I'm sure that's where they had that moment where they're like, oh, it's a no brainer. We'll move this to console because, you know, you don't have peons, you know, chopping trees down over here and going into caves that you have to manage. And then, yeah. you know, all these other units. So like when you play, you're either um, in charge of an airborne division, you know, um, or an air force rather, um, and you're you have helico attack helicopters and stuff like that, uh, transport choppers. You have armor, which is you know tanks and heavy fighting vehicles. Support, which would be you know anti-aircraft vehicles, artillery, stuff like that. Other forms of transport, for, and then infantry, which um, there's a range of that. Everything from snipers to you know guys with stinger missiles to take down the aircraft, guys with javelin rockets to take out tanks, and um, it's totally like anti-Geneva game. I mean, like that's the foundation too. It's like basically um, 1989 and the Red Dawn scenario, remember the old movie? Yeah. Where, like Russia just comes in and decides that they're gonna trash both uh, Europe, when wasn't Union at the time, but Europe and America. And they're gonna come um, and take over American high schools. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Cause like the, ma the maps will have high schools, you know, they'll have like <laughs> burger joints and uh, you know, farmland and stuff, like all the worst, you know, like fears, you're like, you know, here here you are on your farm, you got the chickens in the back, and it's like, all of a sudden, like the Red Army is, you know, dropping down, you know, air dropping into your, into your uh, acreage. It starts off from the small encounter, and it just gets so big, you know, bigger than any RTS or, you know, RTT, or real-time tactics that I've seen. You might have like a laser-guided bomb or something. So, you know, you pinpoint that, you know, just like all the old, you know, the go for one footage and stuff where you see the designator go down and it's boom, all of a sudden a cloud of smoke. And that looks cool. And then it starts ramping up. You know, you have napalm strikes, um, chemical attacks and carpet bombing. That starts to get really cool because you've got just massive planes, B-52s and stuff that are, you know, just dropping a line of bomb. There are a bunch of other intermediary things, but the ultimate, of course, is the nuke. There's just nothing like it. I guarantee you've never seen anything like this in the game. You hear this crazy noise all of a sudden and it's just completely perfect. It sounds just like oblivion, you know? They're trying to pin us down. Look out. 
and it works on a capture point system to back it up. So say, you know, you're you're losing tickets, uh, your your side's losing points because you're not controlling certain areas. You get you save up enough for this, you know, and, and each person has like a special uh, allotment of special points for all those attacks that I just named. And then you could say, look, let's throw them all in the one pool. Let's give them all to Shu or whatever. And then suddenly you've got like 70 points or something instead of 15. And you're like, now you've got like nukes, triple nukes is your option. And you just drop one of those there. So it's a tactical nuke. It's not a strategic nuke oh. designed to take out an entire, you know, like urban area, you know? So it's not the kind that we actually have pointed at Moscow and, and stuff during, you know, prior to various agreements, but it's still, will blast out like I don't know like it maybe like a square mile or something and the thing is just incredible because it's the smoke starts you know going up in a column and a big mushroom cloud just as you'd expect and then it just keeps rising and rising and if you pull out you just see the landscape with just this enormous you know uh, cloud going up on it and then when you go into the area of course everything is just obliterated and if anything survives it's now radioactive for a while and this is why the cat point stuff is cool because they have to stay in in these zones to control them but now it's like completely you know you can't even stand in it without just basically getting wasted unless you got the right kind of vehicle or something unless you're prepared to withstand the radiation the plane feels like huge like do you think it's going to work on a 360. yeah because i think you'd be surprised they're not as as big as you think um the map will look enormous but you know, you can choo you choose where you're going to deploy stuff, and all in all, it's not that big because the units move quickly and stuff. One versus one, which is also possible, would be more difficult because in that that case, each of each player gets like an enormous allotment of points, and instead of just uh, taking charge of one of the four aspects of your armed forces, you're doing everything. But when you're in a big game, 16 versus 16 or something. Um, you really are only doing a few things, and it's like it's all about working with your teammates. Communication is key on Xbox Live. That that should work. Depends, you know, if you're with friends and stuff. Fun to just set up troops like you would toys when you're little, but instead of you know throwing firecrackers on them, now you're throwing nukes on them. So you just set up uh, everything you've got in a street. Maybe you create like a quarter mile long column, looks like a military parade, you know, old school Moscow style, and then just like carpet bomb the whole thing just to watch the guys go flying, the trees fall down, you know, the dirt rain down, and settle back on the ground. So that that stuff's fun too. I think when you first get it, you're gonna be so excited by the explosions. So the ultimate game for blowing shit up, you know. You're gonna be like, I don't even wanna play it, I just wanna blow this stuff up. And they can come back. I mean, that's the that's the deathmatch thing. But you just the units are so disposable. It's like you throw them in, you lose them, then you just boom, just deploy some more. You know, and there's the way that the timers work and stuff. It still staggers it so, you know, you can have an advantage on offense if you're winning. So it's not just like relentless. But but you still you can still get back in the game. You know, it's rare that you're in that kind of situation in a um, in a typical RTS where you're just like really really losing. You know, where you're. Just Completely going out like a bitch and you've got like you're down to like two infantry you know Chris Ben Boyer our senior editor I introduced him to Warcraft 2 over a uh, dial-up a long long time ago and then uh, I just let him build up for like 45 minutes and I'm like you're trying to explain to him how to play it's his first time playing an RTS and then he just was building up his base building up little walls and farms and all that and I'm just building up my army then I'm like oh, I guess it's time to finish him off so I just came in like a tidal wave and just completely wiped him out and this is back, you know, he was like text chat, chatting me, like just swearing up a storm. Yeah. He's pissed off. Like That's he just when everyone would minutes. say, ally up, ally up. Because, you know, they didn't want their stats to get busted. And they try to convince you to like, like, don't do this to me. He would like it if I played with him. Because like, well, what I would do if someone was bad, um, like you'd go to their base, a couple of heroes or something, and just put barbed wire around their headquarters and lock all their guys in it. And then because they hadn't teched up to the level where they'd have wire cutters yet or something, they couldn't do anything. And they'd just be sitting in there. And then I'd take sandbags and you start laying them out to spell shit, like, you know, LOL and stuff. And then they're in there and then you just like do whatever. So it's definitely light, you know, L-I-T-E version uh, compared to, you know, Warcraft or something like that. But um, 
so far it just it seems really fun and stuff. I mean, I don't know like if you'll be playing it forever unless you're with uh, like a group of, of really competitive teammates or something, and you start working out uh, tactics and, and stuff like that. But yeah, I think you'll like it. It's like real-time strategy games are like seen a rebirth on a console.